it's so strange how you think your career is going to go somewhere. And I always kind of wanted to do TV, but it was because of that. Do, writing for free at the Huffington Post was what got me a job. Well, here we are on the Sunday special with Greg Gutfeld, and I can't wait to dive into an exploration of his brand new best-selling book, The Gutfeld Monologues. We'll get to that in just one second. But first, let's talk about your impending death. So, <laughs> life insurance is very important. It is also incredibly confusing, which is why four out of ten people don't have it. Maybe you're one of those people, and you're too lazy. You think, I'm not going to die. But then you die, and your family's poor. Well, if anything were to happen, it is important that your loved ones are taken care of. Besides, life insurance rates are indeed the lowest they have been in 20 years. The best time to buy is now. The best place to buy is PolicyGenius.com. PolicyGenius is the easy way to compare life insurance online. In just five minutes, you can compare quotes from the top insurers and find the best policy for you. And when you compare quotes, you save money. It is that simple. Policy Genius has helped over 4 million people shop for insurance. They've placed over $20 billion in coverage. They don't just make life insurance easy. They also compare disability insurance and renter's insurance and health insurance. If you care about it, they cover it. So if you've been putting off getting life insurance, there is no reason to put it off any longer. Go to PolicyGenius.com. Get quotes, apply in minutes. It is indeed that easy. You can do it right now while you're sitting here. And you should because rates are their lowest in 20 years. Policy Genius is the easy way to compare and buy life insurance. Go check it out right now. I've used Policy Genius myself. I've explored it. It is easy. It is fun. Well, fun might be an overstatement, but it is worthwhile. Go check it out. PolicyGenius.com. That's PolicyGenius.com. Let them know that we sent you. All right, Greg, thanks so much for stopping by. really appreciate it. My dude. pleasure. Thanks so, for having me. Check out this book, folks. If you haven't checked out this book, it's because you're stupid. This book is already <laughs> nearing the top of the bestseller list the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, the Gutfeld Monologues. It has many pictures of Greg Gutfeld yes. on the cover. Yes, you notice it's glossy, too? It's a book that is matte and gloss. Wow. I, I mean, know. It just has all the qualities <laughs> it's you want. Exa- well, you don't even have to read it. a book by its cover. Yes, exactly. It has all of the qualities so, I, I, you I want. stole this from the Brady Bunch. I, so are these actual live photos from the set? Or no, we recreated them because uh, I don't think we were allowed. So I said, just find uh, I, uh, find me, uh, sit me down, make me talk, and then that's what happened. It's, so the book is really clever. For, for those who have not picked it up yet, what the book is, is it starts off with this, this long essay about President Trump's election that I want to get into with you yeah. in just a minute here. But it also goes through a bunch of your old monologues, and it has your sort of commentary on your old monologues, right, which right. is really, it's like the Talmud of Greg Gutfeld monologue. <laughs> it's, really, it's really great that way. And it, I think it's a useful exercise that, I think, honestly, most pundits should do because going back and looking at your old stuff and determining Ugh. what was stupid and what was smart. It was, was hard. It was like, because uh, I didn't remember a lot of the stuff that I said. I'm incredibly repetitive. So if you're on TV every single day, you don't really realize how repetitive you are. The same kind of jokes that you make. And I, I would go through and I go, God, some of these jokes are just so hacky. Like I, every time I, was, I would talk about a left winger, I would mention like a a piercing or patchouli. I just I would just drive into that that lane and I'm going, ah, I got it. So I so the, so I decided in this book to call myself out. So there's like half of the book are the monologues and the other half are just me saying, this is stupid, this is wrong. Ooh, you got it right here. A lot it was like basically I'm heckling yeah. my own book. And uh, uh, but it's weird. I, I I when I go back and I see what I've written, there's like 2000 of them. So I had to pick I put, picked like 200 out of there, but it was it's it's just interesting how there there's a lot of the things kind of like foretold what we're going through now, the, mm-hmm. the, the stuff about law and order. There's a chapter on law and order and terror. It's all about national security and, and security and fear in general that I kind of noticed a trend. And uh, I want to talk to you a lot about the book. I want to start by laying out sort of your life story. How did yeah. you get here? Because a lot of people have seen you on The Five, obviously, yeah. and a lot of people know you from your work in a variety of, of media, including yeah. obviously in, in the book area. But how did you how did you get here in the first place? How did you go from a guy who was writing comedy to a guy who's now yeah. on Fox News it's, every day? It's uh, really weird because I wasn't I'm, I wasn't a comedy writer. I, uh, you know, I started at the American Spectator as a staff assistant in the late 80s. But I was a fitness editor at Prevention Magazine, which was the world's largest fitness health magazine, no longer exists. I jumped to Men's Health and I became the editor of Men's Health. I was their creative director. So I'm a magazine guy. People think that I'm like a comedian, but I don't, I've never done stand up. I never called myself one because I think that if you're a comedian, has to perform. And I don't, I don't stand up in front of people, so I would never do call myself that. And also, I have comedians on my show, and in deference to them, and out of respect to what they do, of getting heckled and doing five sets a night, I'm not a comedian. So I'm, I was a writer. And for Men's Health, I went to Stuff Magazine in America and, and did that and, and got fired over something. And then I, uh, <laughs> you can look up, you can look up that. It involves little people. 
And then I, and then I, uh, they kicked me out, and I lived in LA for a while, and became their director of brand development for Dennis Publishing. And then from there, I became editor in chief of Maxim UK in uh, in London. And that was at when the, when magazines were dying, and especially men's magazines. I I hopped on that dying horse and drove it right into the ground. And then I was kind of like not unemployed, but I got a contract to write a book about England, and I was living there, and I had been writing for. This is how I got here. This is the this is the strangest thing. It has nothing to do with anything that I've done. It has to do with pure luck. Matt Labash, you know, Weekly yep. Standard, emails me and says, "Hey, uh, Ariana Huffington, do you know her?" And I go, "Yeah, she's starting a blog with this other guy, Andrew Breitbart, and whatever." And uh, I, I, they asked me to do it, and I, I can't. Crystal won't let me. Do you want to do it? And I, I go, yeah, sure. So I email Ariana, and she, you know, she says, oh yeah, it's this thing, whatever. Write whatever you want. Of course, we don't pay you. And I'm in London. And I'm like eight. What is it? Eight hours ahead. I can't remember from California. So I just start writing stupid stuff. I wrote a recipe for lemon squares, and I wrote a lost and found thing for every name at at, at the Huffington Post, like things that they've lost. <laughs> and I would just send them, and I didn't realize that they showed up first because I was way ahead, and they got. They got the most attention because I was the mo- I was not a liberal. I wasn't crazy. I wasn't progressive, and I was making fun of them. Mm-hmm. And that's how I met Breitbart because Andrew would call me up and go, "Greg, you can't say that. You can't say that. You can't say that about Ariana." And then five minutes later, he'd call me back and he goes, "I apologize for saying that. Say whatever the hell you want." <laughs> and we became fast friends. And I think he was the one who told the uh, Fox people in LA about yep. me. And those guys emailed one dude in London and I met a guy for a drink at a bar and the next thing you know I was flown over to uh, New York I met John Moody I met Roger Ailes and it, it, it was it happened like that they made me a contributor and then I sat down in a meeting I, I, I flew in my wife and I moved we got a, a, a hotel and we I sat across from John Moody with, uh, with the expectation that this, whatever I was doing which later became red eye we take a year or six months. You feel it out, whatever. And he just goes, okay, so we're going to start tomorrow. <laughs> uh, we're just going to do shows, all right? Do you have, and they're like, do you have any friends that guests? And I'm like, what? And he goes, and it's like, and they, go, and like, they didn't have any staff. It was just me. And I'm like, going, and, they go, yeah. and he goes, yeah, just call some friends. Uh, I, we got to get a director. We got to get a, And I'm like, I'm going, this is, I'm, I'm having a panic attack. Sitting in this office. And so I go like, Holy crap. I called Bill Schultz. Bill Schultz was a features editor at Stuff Magazine when I was there. And he was very funny. He's, you know, he's not, he's just not a TV, like he doesn't, he's not TV ready. He's more like bar ready all the time. I grab him. And then this other dude, Andy Levy, was leaving me comments on the Huffington Post, my Huffington Post <laughs> blog. I hired that. I hired, so this is the only time in history where you could get a job from a comment like nobody, like when you're doing comments on a blog, there, there's no hope for you except for one time in the universe somebody got a job, and so he got a TV gig. So it was a- Andy and Bill and me, and we. It was a it was a terrible show for like three or four months, and then all of a sudden you just kept doing it, and it got better, and all of a sudden it became this cult favorite, and we, we were introducing all kinds of people to the world. Breitbart was on, you were on, I had people like Andrew WK, Amy Schumer, Crowder, you name it, and it kind of took off, and then they. Gave me, and then they gave me a chance on the five. Initially on the five, I was just going to be the fool, which was, you know, do a monologue at the end of the show, and uh, and that's it. And uh, But I kind of, like, said, no way. I'm going to talk about everything. And the five just took off, and that was amazing. And then I got the other show on Saturdays. Uh, it's it's is- a pretty amazing story, and uh, I should say that I—, I- actually followed from afar what was going on with you because I, I was working with Andrew at the time a yeah. little bit and I was like, yeah, there's this guy Gutfeld. You definitely need to read all his stuff. It's amazing. And I just recommended him for this job. And yes. so it was cool. It's cool hearing the first person story because I always heard the third person yeah, story. Yeah, yeah. It was it was Andrew. nuts. And I mean, the stuff, we would, him and I would go back and forth writing uh, the most outlandish stuff. And, and it was like, it was weird. It was like, it's so strange how you think your career is going to go somewhere. And I always kind of wanted to do TV, but it was because of that. Do, writing for free at the Huffington Post was what got my job, got me a job. And Matt Labash reading a blog called The Black Table, which was A.J. Dulario and Will Leach. If you, I don't know if you remember those names. They were ended up at Gawker. But that was an interview they did with me that Labash saw. And it was, it's just, it's I guess what's weird is that none of my prior work experience mattered. <laughs> <laughs> it was just writing for free was what did it. So what shaped your politics? 
Because obviously people think of you as like the funny guy first, yeah, but yeah. you have a pretty strong political point of view. So how did you get where you are politically? I was uh, w in high school. I was naturally a, a liberal. I was I went to Sarah High School in San Mateo, all boys school, and you could get extra credit for doing certain things in certain classes. And one of them was uh, campaigning for the nuclear freeze. So I was into. I, I did that. You get signatures for that. And I don't know if anybody remembers that. It was I think it was Alan Cranston was behind it, but it was to, to ban like the. Deliver, ban the, uh, uh, nu nu any kind of nuclear arms from California. That's what it was, typical California <laughs> thing. So you can't transport them. So I would get, stand in front of you know church and get signatures. So I was a liberal. And then I got to Berkeley and I, got, I was around real, real liberals. But more important, and I know that you understand this because you and I have talked about this, it's not about ideology so much as it is about the mob. And so when, at Berkeley, I saw the mob. I, saw, I, wasn't, I didn't see one liberal. I saw, I saw a thousand. And it's scary when you see a mob. And, and, and I, I've often said that the mob exists elsewhere, too. Like, you, I think you, we've noticed it uh, in this 2016 election when you felt like there was this overpowering, you know, Trumpist thing. And that kind of made me like a whoa. Like, if you say something on the Internet, you get this swarm. And uh, I realized maybe it was four people. <laughs> That's what I was, me and Dana always talking about. It's like, it really was bots and four people. <laughs> That's what it was. But it's amazing. But so I'm always, I think my politics are shaped by the mob. If I sense that there's this weird imitation behavior going on, it kind of freaks me out a little bit. And I, mean, I think it freaks out most people, but it, it just drove me out of the left and it kind of drove me out of the right into more of a libertarian phase. But you even have a little bit of that in libertarianism. Anywhere, any place that there's a bunch of people who want you to believe in something. But I think I'm more like a Reason magazine type political person. I, I think that you know what, what you say about most people thinking individually, I wish that were true. I'm going to fight yeah. you on that. I think yeah. that it's actually what, what, what I found more, in, and this has been the great disappointment to me of my life over the past five, six Scary. years, is the extent to which people will follow an institution so long as they think the institution is important. That's true whether you're talking yeah. about Penn State football or whether you're talking about a political party. People yes. just feel the necessity to defend any institution, that, especially if they feel the institution is threatened from the outside yes. by another institution. And that's what I think is, is scary about politics right yeah. now. Yeah, politics is team sport. It really is. And, you, you know, you wear the, now you wear the colors. And, and, uh, and if somebody... It's, it's weird. I think you learned, I think the left started this. I'm going to say, you know, I, I know it's petty, but I think they started it with the old crowd hammer uh, observation who said that, you know, when you're right, you think they're wrong, but the left think you're evil. No question. So that's how the Raiders look at the 49ers <laughs> and the Mets look at the Yankees. You are evil. You're not just wrong. You are evil. And I'll kick your ass you know, outside of the game. And that's happened. You know, people get in massive fights over grown men, millionaires who don't even know you exist. And in a way, that's a lot like politics. You know, these are grown men, millionaires who don't know, know you exist. But um, I, I guess I lost my train of thought here. Where was I going? I mean, just <laughs> about the tribalism. Of, oh, the tribal. So the tribalism right is something that uh, it, it's, it's making it so that people can't be friends with each other. And I think that began with the left because it became personal. Like politics is personal among the left. But for conservatives, you have other things going on, right? You go, if you're religious, you have... That, and that's actually a larger part of your life. Family, and liberals have families, but it, it always is, if you're an activist, the personal is political. And so they turn that on. You, they, you are evil. Well, it seems to me that they, you have to build a sense of community around something. And if yeah. you're a religious person, like if you ask me, what's my community? Yeah. My community would probably be the Orthodox Jewish community yeah. in which I live, right? Because if, God forbid, I lost all my money tomorrow, yeah. the people who I'd be going to for charity are those folks. But if you're on the left, where's the sense of community coming from, yeah. except from this shared sense of politics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My community is the unicorn community. That's like, <laughs> I've noticed that people into unicorns are like, they cut across all, like I can have leftists who can't stand me, but they, they, they go, he's the unicorn guy. So it's like just a very strange thing with that. But uh, it is true. People want communities. The, the issue is though, like you gotta, like you, people are too close to the fire. You know, wh whether you're anti, like the never Trumper, and the always Trumper are, can be interchangeable because they're just too close to the fire. The, the only thing, and we, we're talking about Andrew Breitbart, the only way out of that is humor. Is like, I, I, we talked about, you and I talked about this a while ago on my podcast, that like, no matter what, how Breitbart would feel about Trump, he would find it hilarious. No question. And I feel that way about my mother too. My mom probably would have started off with the debates 
And she would go, oh, she'd probably call me up because she died five years ago, four years. She'd be like, oh, I can't believe what this guy is saying. Oh, so did you? And then every day it would become, did you hear what he said? And she'd be chuckling. And that's how I think he worked on a lot of people. It was like it was just entertaining and it was funny if he didn't take it seriously. And I think that's the key. People are taking this too seriously. And, and when you talked about your community, that prevents you from taking it too seriously because you have a community that offers you more. Mm-hmm. And I, I mean, it's and also I see this. You know, I, 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 I have to check myself. You know, I'm married. I don't have kids. I could easily just get full bore and think about this crap all the time. I could think about it. I could get it. I could lie awake in the middle of the night and think about what am I going to say. And I realize it's really important to be, like my wife is not political, and she'll just say, "Stop it. It's not. It's nothing. It's stupid." She just pokes a hole in it, and then I'm going, "You're right." You're right. And go out, hang out with people. Go like I love music. I do that stuff. But I think the distance from this is really, really important. And um, and that's what my next. I'm already thinking about my next book. It ain't gonna be about politics. I don't know what. I might be about the Brady Bunch. Well, that'd, that'd be fun. You'll <laughs> be ready. Okay. Before we go any further, I first have to talk about your online security. So with all the recent news about online security breaches, it's pretty hard not to worry about where your data is going or where my data is going. Making an online purchase, simply accessing your email, it could put your private information at risk. You are being tracked online by social media sites. Sorry to tell you about this. Marketing companies, your mobile or your internet provider, not only can they record your browsing history, they're often selling it to other corporations who want to profit from your information, which is why everything's free online. That's why I decided to take back my privacy by using ExpressVPN. ExpressVPN has easy-to-use apps. They run seamlessly in the background of your computer, phone, and tablet. Turning on ExpressVPN protection, it only takes one click, and then ExpressVPN secures and anonymizes your internet browsing by encrypting your data, hiding your public IP address. Protecting yourself with ExpressVPN, it costs less than a seven bucks a month. ExpressVPN is indeed rated the number one VPN service by Tech Radar. It comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee. So, if you ever use public Wi-Fi, you want to keep hackers and spies from seeing your data, ExpressVPN is for you. If you don't want to hand over your online history to internet providers or data resellers, ExpressVPN is the answer. Protect that online activity today. Find out how you can get three months for free at expressvpn.com slash Ben. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N.com slash Ben for three months free with a one-year package. Visit expressvpn.com slash Ben to learn more. Okay, so I promised before we sat down that we were going to talk a lot about your book. So now I want to talk a lot about your book. So. Sure. The, the opening of this book is about a 35-page essay on what happened to you during the 2016 yes. election. And I, I read it and I found myself nodding along because yeah. I think you and I had very similar experiences. Right. I don't think either one of us actually voted uh, for president. I don't know if you voted for a third party or something. I, I, didn't. I, uh, I was, uh, had an absentee ballot, ballot and I wrote, in, I wrote Hillary and I sealed it. And then I walked by one of my friends, Joni, who's uh, one of my producers, but she owned a bar in New York and I trust her implicitly. And she just looked at me. She just gave me a stare. And I walked to the mailbox b- and I took it back <laughs> and I opened up the thing and I crossed out Hillary's name. <laughs> and I was like, I was like, but I couldn't write Trump's name I- either. I just couldn't. And I can't remember what I did. I think I might have put in Crowdhammer's name, mm-hmm. but I don't think I, I or, or I just let and then I just went down Republican the whole way because right. in New York, it doesn't matter anyway. But I uh, yeah, I I was um and that, but what happened to me is that okay. All you could go by with Trump are his uh, during the campaign were words because that's all you got, and so it's like I'm going by his words and I, and I'm I miscalculated I think I was a hypocrite but I'm going by his words and I'm going okay this guy's dangerous uh, I'm tired of defending him and I'm not going to defend him I, and I I used the phrase that he's like a six hour drive to a half an hour at the beach it's like you got to go a long way. To, and then all of a sudden you get there and he's just like he he screws up but he says he he, he says it crudely or whatever and so but once he became president then you talk then you could focus you don't have to focus on the words anymore you could focus on the deeds and it's like and so when I, you already know who he is he won you already know that he can be an a-hole or say all the stuff and i just get used to it and that made it it, it it cleared my mind and i could see what he was doing and i go okay that's pretty good like the climate change thing was amazing to me i've been talking like pulling out of that accord was like, okay, if that's the only thing he ever did, I'm all right with it because it, it, that whole thing pisses me off. I thought it was, a, I thought it was a hundred trillion dollars we were never going to see again. And um, and then you saw you saw other things, the deregulation. There's a lot of the North Korea stuff. I find really really powerful, even though we don't know what's going on. I still thought it was audacious. It tru- like Obama always used the phrase audacious. That was audacious. You know, not sneaking the Iran deal. This was audacious. But anyway, so that was a uh, that was how I shifted 
And the other thing is I talked about me being a hypocrite was that I was going after him for doing what I do on the five. And I think he watched a lot of Fox News and he doesn't he, and he doesn't give a single F. And he gets up there and he says what he wants. And I'm going like, you know what, if I ran for president, would I change or would I be me? And he was just being himself and he's cracking jokes and he's he's transformed the context from a uh, campaign event or a debate to a roast. And that's when I when I saw that, that was like a, a minor epiphany for me that I go, OK, he's he's reworking the rules in the environment. So like I was I gave him a total crap for the John McCain line. And uh, and then I realized that it was a joke and that it was a joke in its own horrible absurdity. Yeah. You know, heroes don't get caught. You know, it's like that's it's so horrible that it's obviously not true and that it was a Chris Rock joke from I don't know how long ago. And even I think Trump had said it after Chris Rock years ago. Like 99. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it was, something, it was something around there. And so that was like going, OK, now that I had to recalibrate how I look at these things, it became much easier for me. But I wasn't going to explain them. I didn't. I coined the phrase Trump splaining during the campaign because I'm going like I have other options. I don't need to explain this guy. I like Rubio. And I like this guy or whatever. And then, but once he became president, I had to start explaining him because he was my president. Two things happened. One, or two revelations. One, I was talking to Rick Rennell, but he was, it was before the show. And I just said, I just, I said the same thing I said to you. I go, I don't want a leader that I have to keep explaining. And he goes, well, then why did you run, Greg? And I go, that's it. And he goes, no, he goes, I'm serious. He goes, you're going to have to explain everybody. Everybody requires explanation. Include so so that's the that's the price you pay for somebody who's going to win. And I said, what? Well, I would probably do less explaining with like a Marco Rubio. And then I thought, no, that's not true because he's he's really pro life. That feminists would have eaten him alive. Like he would have been as evil as anything. He wouldn't have said the crazy things, but he would have been eaten alive. And the way they treated Mitt over uh, cutting somebody's hair when he was in grade school, the dog on the roof. Everybody would be evil, so you would you you'd end up having to explain everybody. Well, I think this, this is how the left successfully pushed the right into Trump is because yes. basically they decided to make Mitt Romney the worst guy in the world. The world. We looked at Mitt Romney, and went, "Wait, what <laughs> the hell?" Uh, yeah, it's like, "Fine, we'll actually run the worst guy in the world and then see what you do about that's, it." That's that's exactly. I remember you saying that. It's like uh, it's like okay, let's do it. You know, it's <laughs> like it's like this guy is going to you know he's going to be. He, I call him the orange meteor because he just flies in and just destroys everything. And, I, and then I look back and I go like, oh, my God, there's so many. Th- I, I remember this moment. The, the, and I'll, this gets into what happened to me at work as well, which is that 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 question Megyn Kelly asked him when she said, you know, you are you've been sex. You've said these sexist things. You've called women pigs and all this stuff. And I was I was sitting with my buddy who's a police officer a guy who owns a restaurant in Westside Steakhouse and my uh, the wife, who's also my producer, we were all sitting there. And he goes, and, they, and Megan asked that question, and he goes, to be fair, it was only Rosie O'Donnell. Everybody in the room laughed. Yeah, right. Everybody laughed. Yeah. And I stood up, I go, hey, that's, that's a first. I've never seen that. I've never seen it. And then the next day, however, I changed. And I changed because I was around people I really, really like and respect who couldn't stand Trump. And I could see their point of view. And there were people that were like Bible Trumpers. That's a good word I just came up with. <laughs> Bible Trumpers. And, but I didn't care for them. And there was, a, there was a certain mass of that group. Where everything he did was incredible genius. Incredible genius. And they were being dishonest. And it was just like they were ruining Trump as a candidate by being disciples. And then the, but then I, I, but the, the people that I really liked were... You know, this guy, he's 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 going to destroy the party, all this other stuff. We don't know what he believes and all this other stuff. There's nationalism. And and that's, so I think I was in I was caught in this world and then it got easier when he won. It was like now yep. I can but at that night, I so saw the first essay in there is about the night that he won, which was amazing. It was like an earthquake. Watching people wandering around in a daze. The people there were people that were telling me he didn't have a chance that he would, the election would be called by nine o'clock. It would be over. And then watch, I, they had this New York Times ticker, you yep. know that round thing? Yep. So it had, I was at a bar, because we were doing two fives. So between six and I think midnight. So I went to a bar to have something to eat. And it, um, the ticker had her at 100%, like 99%. 99%. For, in favor. And I'm telling the doorman that, who's pro-Trump, that yeah, and he almost started crying. 
And then, it, and then I'm watching and it keeps moving down. And by, it's like 50%. And then it's 40% f- against Hillary. And then it becomes like 70% for Trump. It was, it's a movie. It, it was, you were like watching, I don't know what movie it is. It, it's a movie where the whole world turns upside down and you're watching it before your eyes. And people are like in a daze. And then she doesn't even show up. She doesn't even show up. And who gets up on the, who got up on the stage? Podesta. Podesta. And it was like, that's the movie that should be made is that, that inc- if, if Hollywood had a, any fairness, that movie is like. It would make great comedy. I mean, the whole yeah. thing was so, just unbelievable. And you know comedy. that, I mean, I, I, okay, there were people that really did believe Trump was going to win. Uh, Trump wasn't one of them. I don't I think mean, so. No, I don't think so. No, nobody who looked at data thought Trump was going. <laughs> Listen, I lost $10,000 on that election betting people, specifically because I was looking at the data yeah, and I was figuring yeah. all this data can't be wrong, yeah. but the it's data what, can it, be wrong. You know, it has to be the most, in, your, in our lifetime, the most phenomenal, p- phenomenal political event in America. Like in I, our, think it's, I think it's the most phenomenal sh- political shock in American history. I yeah, mean, the, yeah, just yeah. the disparity between the popular yeah. vote and, and, the, and the electoral college alone is the yeah. greatest disparity. And then the forecast, like the, the, the truth is we talk about Trump and Trump is the center of the political universe. Yeah. But the truth is that Hillary, that was a referendum on Hillary. Yeah. Everybody basically did the same thing that you did yeah. in the election in Ohio and Wisconsin, which yeah. is they just said, you know what? I'm not going. Like yeah. She's going to win anyway. I'm not going to do it. What's yeah, exactly. This? It was the Brexit. It was like, if they did Brexit again, all the people that didn't vote would, would vote. Be, would That's vote. Right. We'd vote. That's why I think, and I've talked about this on the shows, that if Hillary, they would never give it to her because they hate her so much, the Dems. But if she, if she got the nomination, everybody would vote. Yeah, that didn't vote because they'd wanted, they'd, and also the rematch would be insane. It would, this would be the greatest political story to have a rematch between the two. Would be, uh, would be, I, I mean, I don't know why they haven't. Uh, somebody must be thinking about that because they figure that she's what now, uh, yeah, twice loser, and she yeah. can't like they're figuring they got to go intersectional too. They're going to try and pick somebody who yeah. is more intersectional than yeah. Hillary was, or maybe it'll be Michael Avenatti. Who knows? It could be anyone. Oh man, that, that would be amazing. I, I still think Kamala. I, she's when I hear her talk, she's forceful. I also think, you know, I, I talk about this, the contrast theory that um, that because there were 17 people that were similar and Trump stood out, yep. he got the plurality. It, that that could happen with the Dems. There's going to be 17 people, and it could be like a Mark Ruffalo. Ruffalo. You know, it could yeah, be it like could be an somebody act, out of the box. Out of the box. Could be, you know, you know who's like Trump? Rosie O'Donnell. Rosie O'Donnell is like Trump. Oh, man. Um, uh, reality, TV talk show host, outspoken, and you can say she's crazy, but conspiratorial. I mean, it's almost... Man, would that be a match? <laughs> America deserves Don't even this. open your mouth, Greg. Just stop America this. We, can't, we cannot survive this. this is, like, you just open your mouth to this, and it's going to be reality now. I, We're going to no, look feel, back at this I, tape, and I it's going to be... I feel like it could happen. Listen, I think it, when people joke about Avenatti, I'm not sure it's such a joke, no, because he's, he's considered like the most anti-Trump person in the world, yeah. and he's got this whole, I'm a pugnacious fighter yeah, routine yeah, yeah, going, yeah, yeah. and so... Avenatti Daniels on the other side. I mean, it's just it's 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 all madness. I do want to ask you though. Um, you know, in that essay, when you talk yeah. specifically about you know your your perception of Trump change, because you said if I were running, what would it look like? Yeah. Do you think? But you, you wouldn't think you should run. I mean, that's sort of no, the, that's yeah. sort of the issue. And and so when I was reading it, I was thinking that's true. If you consider him in the comedic context, then yeah. none of this is like some of it's supremely offensive. You know, like yeah. grabbing women by the genitals is yeah. not great. But you know, and even the John McCain comment is not yeah. great. But yeah. but it's but. Put in the presidential context, I think this is where the left has truly lost their mind and where a lot of us in the election cycle were going, this is not appropriate because yeah. the president should be something different from a stand-up comedian, or maybe he shouldn't. Maybe you think that this is like the new reality and we should just I, embrace I, it. I I don't know. Like, I was at a point where I don't know. Is, has he redefined it? Has he changed it? So that we, like, you can wish that you wanted a Jeb, but it, that wish isn't coming true anymore. <laughs> in, fact, I, in fact, I don't know... If there is any going back, like if, if he's gonna if he's gonna run for re-election in 2020, and he's up against a Liz Warren, and he's going to he's gonna drag her down into the mud. Yeah, oh it's, my and he's gonna run circles around her. He's gonna have the 20 was it 23 and Me? Is that what it's called? Yeah, the, he's gonna have that. <laughs> he's gonna shake that around. I mean, because like he went, he pretty much man he manhandled some pretty smart people. Rand Paul, I mean, just like I mean, it was just like. Simple throwaway lines. There you go. You're going to fall off the days if you get any further to the end. These were like very classic lines. Uh, that's why I think it's got to be somebody who is funny. Yeah, who that, can, that's, who, the, that's yeah. the big issue. But remember when Marco tried to be Trump? Well, yes. And that was like... Well, Marco can only be Marco, right? Yeah, yeah, and that, yeah. that was the big problem. I mean, I was I was very pro-Cruz, obviously, during yeah. the primaries. Yeah. And he was my boy. Yeah. And, and yeah. I was telling Cruz's people, 
Like the, halfway through the election cycle, you got to stop punching Rubio, and Rubio's got to stop punching you because yeah, you yeah. guys are going to punch each other out, and Trump's yeah. just going to run right up the middle. Yeah. But none of them ever ever had the capacity to outman Trump, and that's really what I think was. People say, oh, maybe it was his policies. You see people trying to intellectualize Trump. Well, maybe it's that he likes tariffs, or maybe it's that he likes big spending, yeah. and it's like. No, no, no. <laughs> what, what, what people like about Trump is that he hits people. Yes. That's what people like. <laughs> yes. they like. They like watching him hit things. It was and, great. It was great TV. And it, 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 was, it was just like, it was a roast. I think that's where he picked us all up. When he did the two, when he did the, he did a Comedy Central roast where he was, I think that's where he got it. And, and I think when they did the White House Correspondence Center and they roasted him, he was like, you know what? Screw these people. I'm yeah, just going to, yeah. I'm going I'm to do this right back to them. Yeah, exactly. yeah, I want to talk to you a little bit more about possible 2020 matchups and some more about your book, yeah. The Gutfeld Monologues. But first, Let's talk about your sleep quality. There is nobody on the planet like you, so why would you buy a generic mattress built for everyone else? Helix Sleep built a sleep quiz. It takes two minutes to complete. They use the answers to match your body type and sleep preferences to the perfect mattress. Whether you're a side sleeper or you're a hot sleeper, you're like a plusher from bed. With Helix, there is no more guessing, no more confusion. Just go to helixsleep.com slash bengast, because I have a guest. Take their two-minute sleep quiz. They will match you to a mattress that will give you the best sleep of your life. For couples, Helix can even split that mattress down the middle, and they can provide individual support needs and feels preferences for each side. They have a 10 your warranty. You get to try it out for 100 nights risk-free, so you really have nothing to lose. Go check it out right now. Helix is offering up to 125 bucks off all mattress orders. That's 125 bucks off at helixsleep.com slash bengast. Again, because I have a guest, that's helixsleep.com slash bengast for 125 bucks off your mattress order. I have one of these mattresses in my house. It comes in the mail. You unwrap it. It inflates right in front of you. You pop it on the bed frame. You're good to go. I got one for my sister for her wedding. It's what she actually requested because she'd heard me talk about it. It is that good. Go check it out right now. It's helixsleep.com slash bengast. Again, use that promo code bengast to let them know that we sent you. That is B-E-N-G-U-E-S-T, helixsleep.com slash bengast. Okay, so with all that said about election 2020, I'm in full agreement with you that, that it needs to be somebody aggressive from the other side. It also, to me, needs to be somebody who's been through the mill a couple of times because mm -hmm. what Trump is particularly good at is taking people and just ripping them down. Yes. If, they, if they have any place to go that is below where they were, he will take them all the way. He drags <laughs> them down to hell, right? There, there are circles yes. that Dante has not yet discovered <laughs> that he has dragged Hillary down to. And yes. that means that my problem for, you know, if you're a Democrat and you're looking at Kamala Harris, you're thinking, oh, okay, well, she's yeah. the thing. Right, but she's got the squeaky clean image. How long yeah. is that going to last by the time that yeah. he really goes after her? Which is why I still think that their best option is probably somebody like Joe Biden, it's, just because Biden's been through the ringer a bunch it, of times. It's so, it, 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 I, I never would have thought of that until recently, because I think of the age that he might get be, be up there, but maybe he's not. How old is he? He's going to be 78. Yeah. Trump will be 74. They'll hit each other with their walkers. Yeah. It'll be, <laughs> they'll combine age 3,000. Yeah. The, the baby boomers will never leave us alone. Yeah. Ever. The, the commercials will be great. You'll get a lot of catheter ads. <laughs> 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 and, uh, uh, what's the other one? Uh, you get a lot of William Walk-in showers. The walk-in walk showers. <laughs> the, the acorn chair lift. They get spots of the debates. I should be making fun of them because they're they're very good advertisers. Um, I'm, by the way, I want an acorn chairlift, so I'm hoping that they'll sponsor me one day. I don't, you know what? I'm uh, a little worried about the. We talk, We also were talking about this before about the pendulum. That yeah. this this it it, it 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 could go two ways. If the economy is great, then everything's going to be great. But if the economy isn't great. You're going to get this pendulum switch swing from Trump to something so opposite and so frighteningly progressive that, you know, I, I, I don't even know who that could be. Yeah. I don't even know if we know Bernie. that person. Yeah, it could be Bernie. Right, I mean, why Bernie. not? Yeah, yeah, why not Bernie? We could have a social, we could have a socialist president. And you could have a, and could have a Democrat Congress with a socialist president. I oh, mean, this is, God, this is, the, this is me. why when, you know, when people say, aren't you glad how 2016 went? I'm like, yeah, of course I'm glad how yeah. 2016 went, but I'm not going to be able to write the rest of that story until I find out what happens over the next four years. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. a lot can change between now and then. And this is where I wonder, whether, you know, President Trump, who we've all gotten used to. I mean, the fact yeah. is, I laugh at stuff from him. You're right. Now yeah. that he's the president, there's the stuff his administration does, mm. which, for the most part, I really like. Yeah. And then there's the stuff he says, which, to me, is, like, as crappy as it ever was, for the main part. <laughs> uh, and the, and so, when I look at that, I'm like, okay, I can deal with that, because yeah. I can deal with it. Yeah. But if he toxifies the brand to the point that Republicans lose yeah. in this upcoming congressional election, they lose the House, and maybe lose the Senate, or they lose that in 2020, and suddenly you're looking at a unified Democratic Congress right. and a Democrat president, and what Republicans got out of that was a tax cut and a couple of Supreme Court justices, mm -hmm. you know, then we're going to have to look back and say, okay, was this yeah, was it worth, worth it? it? And, yeah. I, and maybe the answer is still yes, but I think that it's a lot more of a divided, like right now it's of course worth it because we haven't seen the downside. Yeah, yet, yeah, yeah. Right? But yeah, it, it, one, one big thing could change the whole, like anything in the economy 
and, and, and we could be in big trouble. But I don't know, man. It seems like everything seems to be going, o- going okay. The economy seems like it's stable. Yes. It's, it doesn't feel like there's, it, it's fake. It does, feels kind of real and that it's moving. And I, I, I disagree with tariffs. You know, the interesting thing is, I, but, he, but I end up learning more about this stuff. Because he's, you know, talking about it and I go, well, maybe these ne- these are negotiating tactics that I'm not aware of. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden he gets the, the uh, whatchamacallit, the uh, EU. EU back mm-hmm. on track. They're going to pay this. They're going to do that. And it's like, maybe he's right. It's like, it's all about, it's all the art of the deal. Right. <laughs> oh, and, and, and whether they're backfilling it or not, maybe it's yeah. him saying stuff and the administration backfills it. Whatever yeah. it is, he still gets credit for the stuff that happens at the top. It also means that he gets the blame when Amorosa is hired. Yeah, yeah that's, that, he's got to take responsibility for that. And I, there's, you know, he talks about he only hires the best people. That was, everybody knew that was a problem. Everybody. He hired Mike Flynn, Steve Bannon, Rex Tillerson, and Amorosa. Yeah. I think it's fair to say he does not initially hire the best yeah. people. Like, I like Tillerson, though, right? Didn't, was he okay? Eh, I, I, I can't remember. Fan. Yeah, it was it, so, far, they, they, it was so was, far away. Trump had him fired on the toilet. Right, oh, I mean, that's so it's a right. Quick, right. You remember that? Like, Trump, yes. This is the, the deep, dark truth about President Trump: is the guy actually doesn't like firing people. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. I, think, I think deep down, actually, he wants to be liked. Light, yeah. And so he actually has to have his subordinates fire people, right? Yeah. So there's that tape that came out of Kelly firing Amorosa, and then yeah. Amorosa calling up Trump. He's like, I don't know, it's going. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I've done that. <laughs> no, I've done that. No, I do that when um when that's kind of like when uh, a guest. Oh, I have a show that. I don't think the guests will work that week, mm-hmm. and for reasons that the, maybe I don't think the topics yeah. will gel. And I when and then the, the the guests will call me, and I go, "They did what? Wait, you got bumped for my show? Well, let me see about that." But it was me. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it was me. I did it. But it was like I go. I just go. I don't want to get it. I just don't want to deal with yeah, it. You're the guy who fired in the elevator. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, I just. But I get like some people don't want to know. That it's like, dude, you, I need somebody like who who has some kind of background on this, or it doesn't work with this other guest. You're too similar, but I can't. Like, I'm not going to sit there and talk because it, t- it hurts their feelings. Yeah. So I just I just go. I don't want to do it. I just go. So I go. You know what? I can't believe they did that. Let me let me see what we can do, and then I then I run away and hide. <laughs> <laughs> so here's a question for you. You know, what should we take seriously, and what what shouldn't we? Because you say that you sort of recast President Trump, and you recast politics through this lens of maybe I just shouldn't take it all that much yeah. that seriously, and. It, when you take it as comedy, it's freaking amazing. Yeah, comedy. it is. It's it is. so good. And this is why the left can't handle Trump because they're taking everything so seriously. Yeah. And then you, if you're on the right, it's so funny. And yeah. the fact that they're taking it so seriously basically turns them into the school marm yeah. while this hysterical comedy is going on right in front of you. Yeah. When should we take it seriously and when should we not take it seriously? It's a really good question because, you know, I'm thinking about the, okay, like the, like the tweeting it, I, the tweeting doesn't bother me. That doesn't bother me. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything that I'm wor- that I'm truly worried about. He's a pacifist, don't you think that? Like, that he just wants to avoid war at all yes, costs. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 and so it's like I don't think he's going to put us. He's, I don't think he's going to pull like a Clinton and go like I got to distract you with a war. No, I, I think he's a pacifist punctuated by points of rage. Yes. That, like, yes. like he doesn't want to get into a conflict, but if you prick his pride right? a little bit, yeah. it's like I will fire a missile into Syria. <laughs> and it will yeah, that's, like that. that. That's Boom. what I'm. Yeah, but it, I just feel like I mean maybe he has a maybe he has a blind spot with with certain things. Um, yeah, I mean the race issue, for example. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. People are taking that very seriously yeah. from the left. Obviously, like the rallies. The rallies. Okay, you know what? I, I, I'm, I have rally fatigue because now he's the he's that band that does the greatest hits wherever they go, and you see him at the fairgrounds. You know, America. With a band like that goes up and they do. <laughs> they have like the horse with no name or whatever the song is, and and so he does these. He doesn't. Int- he's not introducing anything really new into these things. And I, I, I think sometimes I go like, you know, I go, I think that this, that I'm getting tired of that. And I do think that he, he doesn't have to keep pricking some of these things. Like the NFL kneeling. Yeah, it's like, it's example. like, you know, I say this on the five because I think I said he, he, he can meet with Kim Jong-un. He can meet with Putin. Make it a standing invitation to be, I, I, I mean, I would never have said this before about BLM, but I would now if you could find like the, the, the Hawk Newsoms the, uh, the, uh, and, 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 and then the players and have a meeting. And if they say no, maybe one will say yes. Right. But say, I have a standing offer. I want to talk to you about this. I want you to persuade me. What am I not seeing about this? And that would be interesting for him to do. I think it would be a great thing. He's talking about prison reform. He can talk about this. But I think they don't want to meet with him now. Right. You know? well, I mean, that, and, that's and, what's kept him both right wing. But it also, you're right, it has kept him, you know, the president for a lot of people who 
love him, but a lot of the people who really don't like him don't see him as their president. And he yeah. really, he, he does have the capacity to cross, especially because he is very good interpersonally. I mean, yeah. from everything that I've heard, you know him personally a little bit. Yeah. I've heard that like one-on-one, -on -one, he's actually pretty no, he's, terrific. He's incredibly charming, and I'm sure he gets along with everybody he insults, like whether it's Pelosi or even, even the Clintons. I'm sure him and Bill laugh it up about God knows what. You know, they have shared experiences. <laughs> Let's just leave it at that. <laughs> but, but I do think, yeah, I think that it was, Dana made this point too on the five that if, if, if let's say you get the Senate, but you lose the House, I mean, that could be good for him. Yeah. You know? They try to impeach him. Yeah, yeah, he yeah. Gets the backlash. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, but also, he, but maybe he'll work with, he'll work a little bit, you know, with them. I don't know. But I think he tried to work with, I mean, he tried to work on the immigration thing. He was giving up a lot, I thought. Yeah, he was. He, no, they the, still said no. Right, exactly. Because they did want to give him the wall. That's exactly right. Yeah. But, so I had three concerns with President Trump before he was elected, and, and some of them have been alleviated. So my three concerns were policy, because who the hell knew? Yeah. And then his policy has been pretty good, as we've discussed. Yeah. And then there was the problem of him toxifying the brand, yeah, um, which, which is, still is still, I think, on the table. Uh, and then the third problem was sort of the soul suck of the Republican Party, the idea that people were going to back anything, mm -hmm. no matter what he said or did. And I think that's been sort of half true, mm -hmm. meaning that there's still people in the Republican Party who look at his trade policy and they're like, nah, you know, yeah. no. But you know, look at look at kind of polls of the. There, there's a difference between I, I would say the the kind of people who do this professionally right. and the people who are in the the sort of political class, and yeah. then the rest of the Republican base, which does I think follow him almost yeah. lockstep on a lot of these issues. Yeah. Uh, you know, where are you on those particular worries? Because I'm still, when, when I think of like what I think is funny and what I think is not funny, yeah, the yeah. stuff I think is funny is the stuff where he's just mouthing off and it's yeah. on Twitter and he's just mouthing off. But the stuff that I worry about is the sort of toxification of brand or the division of Americans along lines where they didn't have to be divided. So initially, to take the NFL example, I was like, he's right, obviously. Like, mm -hmm. don't kneel for the anthem. Yeah, and yeah. What, what is this nonsense? Yeah. And of course, he's correct. But then you watch the polls, and it turns out that 75% of Americans didn't like the kneeling. Yeah. And then he says something, and now only 60% of Americans <laughs> don't like the kneeling. It's like he wins because he's still got 60%. Percent, but 15% but yeah. just dropped in terms of it the was, kneeling. It was the, like, the way he does it, the sons of bitches. That was, right. the, that was like, and I, and I, like, I, you know, Tyrus is, uh, is on my show, and he is somebody I implicitly trust. And that really, bu that bugs him. It's like, it's like, why do you have to do this? It's like, you know, they're, 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 these are guys who have legitimate feelings and grievances, and they're not sons of bitches. So that's, I think that's a misstep. But this is the, this is the, uh, ra this is the rally Trump where he gets up there, mm -hmm. and he just goes off. And it's like, that's the thing that, that's the thing that I have, I'm getting tired of. But he's, a, he's, a, he's now a, he's a traveling comedian who's fell in love with the audience. I think that's what Norm MacDonald described him, is that he, li he he's loves the sound. It's wonderful. People are loud. And it's like, so he ends up kind he's of- He's a performer. He's a performer. And he, get, he, get, he says these things. That, that's kind of like, that change, that harms, I guess, the brand. But who knows, man? Maybe the brand needed a kick in the pants, you know? And he, oh, the other thing, there is a brand called Winning, and that's like, you know, I, I sounded like Charlie Sheen there. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. Erase, reset. erase, erase, reset. <laughs> um, but it, like, people are just like, maybe they're going like, he won. It's like, oh, like it, the Ann Coulter model. Right. Which is like, okay, you want to just keep losing with McCain, keep losing with Mitt Romney. This guy won. Well, this, yeah, is, this was the part. Remember she said the old abortion, remember the abortion line. Right. Yeah. He performed abortions at the White House as long as he, yeah. yeah. The, the, but he, he, this is... I think that this is the part about Trump that's that's really fascinating. And also, you wonder whether there could be somebody who takes the benefits of Trump, but without the drawbacks. Meaning yeah, that yeah, yeah. what Trump is really good at is, he's, as we said, he's a great puncher. He likes yeah. punching things. As I said, the entire election cycle, he's a hammer in search of a nail. Sometimes he gets a nail, and it's really satisfying. Yeah. Sometimes he gets a baby, and it's really <laughs> unsatisfying. <laughs> yeah. And it's in, But <laughs> could there be somebody who actually knows how to knife fight without all the baggage? Because the way that the baggage is excused by a lot of folks on our side is we go... Well, you know, but he has to do that to win. Yeah. And I wonder whether it's a package deal or whether somebody who actually knew how to knife fight but also wasn't all of this right. would, would actually be of, of benefit to, to the party. Maybe that, it may be too early to ask that question. We'll find out in 2020, 2024. Or, you know, what could happen? The Democrats could win by doing, um, we need a break. Right. We need a break. Back to so normal. We're, we're going to just give you the most comfortable pajamas you could uh, you could imagine. So Biden is comfortable pajamas, and then you have a VP that's also a comfortable sweater. So it's like center centrist, uh, likable, and it's like we're not no. You know what? Yeah, we're gonna have debates. Let him beat us up, but we're just gonna be like Biden Mansion or something. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. We're just gonna like we're gonna just relax and get through this. 
because America's, America is exhausted. It's like, it's like Trump was four years at the amusement park and you now just want to go to a spa. <laughs> that, that, <laughs> and I think, detox. I think there's some truth to that because if you look at how people are dealing with Trump, it's basically like, Everything's great. Like I was, yeah. I was at a, I was at a restaurant with David Mamet mm -hmm. uh, down in in Santa in Santa Barbara. Drop that name, pick it right back up. But David Mamet, but give it, him my best. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have a great damn. I have a great David oh, Mamet. Do you story. really? Okay. Oh yes, yes, yes. Uh, well, Should fair. we save it for another time? It's a little embarrassing for me. It's for embarrassing oh, okay. for me. So it actually is a good story. <laughs> okay. But. So well, so okay. Tell tell David Mamet story then. I mean, you can't catch it like to, that. I asked him to be on my show, and he's a really good man. He called me personally. And uh, he goes, I'm, hi, uh, this is David Mamet. And I'm like, whoa, this has got to be five years ago for Red Eye. And he goes, I'm not going to be on your show. I just want to let you know why. And I go, okay. And he goes, do you remember when uh, Andrew Breitbart uh, and you were uh, co-hosting or hosting for Dennis Miller's show uh, a couple years ago? Maybe it was like 2008. Or, and I go, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think Breitbart was hosting and I was a uh, guest. Yeah, and uh, uh, I guess you were talking about my book, uh, the Mamet book that came out, The Secret Knowledge or whatever. Right. And he goes, he goes do you remember the comments you made about my wife's acting? And all of a sudden, I felt this flush <laughs> of like absolute, it was, it was shame, total shame that no one's ever done this to me before. And he goes, I go, yes, I do. And he, and I, I, I made fun of her acting. Yeah. And he just, and I go, and I go, I want to, I go, I want to apologize. I said, I apologize unequivocally for what I said. And he goes, I accept your apology. I accept your apology, but I won't be doing your show. And I go, I understand completely. He said, thank you. I go, thank you. Have a great day. That was it. <laughs> <laughs> Bro, that's an amazing story. I was, I was having lunch with David Mamet down in Santa Monica, and I was looking around, and and everybody is, it's this shishi restaurant, $200 bottles of wine yeah, and yeah, sparkling yeah, yeah. water and the whole, the whole deal. And I figured everybody in this room is extraordinarily wealthy, yeah. and they all think the world is ending because of the feeling of chaos that just kind of yeah. comes off the administration in waves. Omarosa being the latest example. Like, do yes. I care that Omarosa was in the administration? No, it's no. stupid. Who cares? Yeah. Like, do I think that she was actually recording national security secrets and then she's going to bring them out on Good Morning America or something? No, it's yeah. just, it just it feels like a constant exhaustion. constant exhaustion. I mean, I'm exhausted. Yes. You're exhausted. Yeah. Like, every day, it's it, like, we, we, we measure this stuff because we're in the news business. We right. measure this stuff in terms of news cycles. Right. I'm old enough to remember, barely old enough to remember when Obama was president. Yeah. And it's only been a year and a half, right? Yeah, like, know, like yeah. every, every week in Obama land was basically like a week. Yeah. And every minute in Trump land, like, we've been doing this for, for almost it's an hour. Insane. We probably missed at least three firings <laughs> and a couple of news cycles exactly. in the time that we're taping this. Exactly. And, yeah, no, you know what it is? I, I don't know if I say it in that book or a speech I did. It's like he's removed time, so everything happens at once. It's like time is for a reason, you know? <laughs> so you have you can have your breakfast, your lunch, and your dinner. But Trump has made it so that breakfast, lunch, and dinner happens at once. Everything's happening at once. Without time, we would all, it would be all simultaneous chaos. And sometimes you'll wake up and you'll go, that's why the, like, the Twitter trends are not a good thing to look at because you think the world's ending. They'll be like Trump. Omarosa, something else, Trump, and it's like the world's ending, and then you, but then you find out it's all nothing. Right, then you turn off Twitter, and it's like that's oh, a nice day outside. It's a nice day. <laughs> <laughs> it does feel like that, but and I do think the one thing that could save, it could either save or threaten the country, is the fact that both sides are pinging ponging off each other so hard right now. Yeah. that it makes the left totally crazy, and this is driving them not to nominate the comfortable pajamas. Right, yeah, it yeah, is yeah. driving them toward the intersectional politics. In your book, you talk a lot about the identity politics, and you've been, you know talking about this for years in your yeah. monologues yeah. about the identity politics of the left. Do you think that the left is in any mood to move away from that? Or do you think they're I, just going to keep doubling down on I this I think stuff? they have no choice to, but to keep going. I mean, look, I think the, the right choice is to abandon it. And you see that with like, you see Bill Clinton saying, said as much. But I don't know, man. They got a lot of power. They got the loudest voices. And they're, that oppressor versus oppressed ideology, is, a, is it, it's a cult. It's a brainwash. You can't see out of it. Once you see, put that filter on, Everybody's an oppressor, but that. But sooner or later, they're going to turn on each other. I think, but I don't know how they get out of it. I, I, I maybe they won't. I, I think that it, it's interesting. I talked to you know some folks on the left, just as you do, and I was talking to one gal who I'm friends with, Jane Coaston, over at Fox, and we at Vox, and we were discussing the um, the the fact that she is very ensconced in the context. She's constantly yeah. talking about the context, right? So when you look at what Trump says, you have to take it for the context. Or yeah. when you look at Sarah Zhang at the New York Times saying racist things, yeah. it's not really racist because you have to look at the context. Right. And I kept saying to her is that, you know, in my view, yes, co historical context matters, of course. And yes, we have to look at how groups, how group dynamics work yeah. and all that. 
But that's like 15 to 20 percent of the story in America. The other, the other 85, 80 percent of, of what you do in America is basically you making individual decisions. Right. But it's a very comfortable place to be. And I think both sides are falling into this, that we, we have stopped thinking about the individual decisions we make. And now we're looking to politics to solve all of our problems. Right. And that's actually creating this reactionary cycle where on the right, it's like, well, my town is going away because of the, the freaking Chinese and Mexicans. Yeah, 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 yeah. And on the other side, it's, well, my town is being threatened by these alt-right Nazi goons yes. who, are, who are running the police departments. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it, it is now, it's, a, it's two camps. But then, but then you said something about nice weather. That's, it, it's an interest. you can choose, like, you can choose to step away. And it's like, it's like, it's gone. I find that it's gone. I find that social media has exasperated all this stuff. Or is it exasperated? Exacerbated. Exacerbated. Well, exacerbated, exacerbated or yeah, that- <laughs> exasperated. But, uh, uh, but uh, it, 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 if I step out of it, it's great. The only thing is if, it does, if you can step out of it, but it comes for you. So right. you end up getting, you'll be, you'll be doing stuff with your kids or something, but it, you can't turn that thing off when it comes after you. I think that's my next book. I'm, I'm doing something. I'm writing about like how do you solve these, these ritualistic crucifixions? You know what I mean? They're, that happened. Oh, yeah. It's insane. And I think that's that's the skip. That's where it keeps going. Like it's not just this. It's not just their side and our side. It's I'm I'm getting this person and I'm pulling this person out and destroying that person. That's what it is. Now. It makes I, people that, feel so. It's the good. scalping and it feels yeah, it feels great. And you, and I I'm, I've written about this. You got to resist the mob, even if you don't like Joy Reid. Like I could have. I swear, if we wanted to, we could have gotten her to lose her. We, but we didn't. As conservatives, we just said, you know what. She said these awful things. But if it was you, if it was me, we would have been gone. No question. You know, no question. She, she get, she get. Like I defended Joy Behar when she said this stuff about the Chris, about Christians. I think. Yep. On the View, and she had to apologize. I defended her. I was like the only, one of the few people because I, I'm like going like, we got to stop. We have to be. We have to be somewhat. We have to be the leaders. If we're the winners. We have to lead. But, I mean, I do think that we have to set up a feeling on the left that if they continue this, that there will be consequences. Yeah. But by the same token, it's hard to balance that with, yeah. you know, let's not destroy people just because we can. And, yeah. and and the fact is that we now live in this, you're, you're exactly right. I mean, I remember, you know, it was probably three weeks ago now where that actor-director Mark Duplass just yeah. tweeted out something nice about me and suddenly he was <laughs> deleting it and apologizing yes. in this Maoist it was fashion. The worst. And then James Gunn jumped in and then he lo- I destroyed half the MCU by literally <laughs> sitting here doing nothing, right? Yes. I was just sitting here doing nothing. Yes. And suddenly James Gunn loses his job. And I thought to myself, like, if this stuff doesn't stop, yeah. then, like, the internet is bleeding into real life. The social yeah. media are bleeding into yeah. regular life. I used to think, and it's, it's a depressing thought when you spend your life in politics and, yeah. and doing political commentary trying to inform people, I used to think that the future of the country lay in the informed 40%. There are 40% of the American public who are into I politics mean, yeah. and very informed and following the news. I'm starting to think there might be the opposite, that maybe the future of the country lies in the 60% that absolutely watches nothing that any of us do. <laughs> do I, and all they do is like go to baseball games and they watch a little TV at night and I they hope, mainly spend time like doing other things. I really hope that's the case. <laughs> yeah, I, I hope so too. Because if not, we might be screwed. No, it, it, but it is this, this, this new kind of like, uh, if, you have, like if you have a bad day, you, your life could be over. So like, let's, let's say you get in an argument at Walmart. Somebody films that. Yep. You could have a, like I said this uh, a couple weeks ago on the five that if my par- if this social media stuff was around with my parents, my mom would have been a meme. You know, she would spank me if I was a- acting up in public. You know, that you, if that somebody catches that, you're gone. Everything's being every. It's a nation of narcs. We're all catching. We're all like, I got him. I'm gonna put that up there, and it's just like I remember when there was Paula Dean, right? I mean, yeah, they're like yes. she said something racist, like she said she's the N word in like the 70s. Yeah, and it's like okay, now let's destroy her entire business now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because of a racist thing she said in 1973. Yeah, and, and, they, like, and then they just disappear. Like they're, right. they're, people are are they're vanished. She's vanished. Yep. There's a few other people too. I mean, that you just go, where do they go? Is there an island? Do where you are? And, and can people? <laughs> and also, can people come back? Right. You know, is can Louis C.K. come back? I, don't I think know. he should, by the way. Yeah. I think Louis C. Like, I'm one of these people who I think Louis C.K. should come back. Yeah, he didn't, I, like, what he did was bad. Yeah. But he, it's not like the guy was, you know, trying to portray an image of himself like he's a priest he or something. He talked about this stuff. Right. He talked about this stuff. Yeah. And, you know, once he's done his time and done his repentance, it seems yeah. to me that he should be able to, like, he didn't actually rape anybody. Yeah. He did some really bad stuff. Yeah. But that's not rape. And I think that we, we also have no gradations, right? Yeah. Even for me saying that he did bad stuff, but it's not rape. I'll get destroyed for yeah, that yeah, yeah, because yeah, yeah. all of these things are rape. Everything yeah. is equivalent to the worst. Even when you ask for a spectrum, uh, people will see that 
as dismissive. dismissive. Right. It's like, I just want to, like, because they say, no, there's no, there's no spectrum. That is bad. That is just yeah, bad. Yeah. Unless it's like a, a, an Asian person saying bad things about white people, then, mm-hmm. of course, it's not bad at all. Mm-hmm. And once you divide it into this dichotomy of good versus bad as opposed to, here's a spectrum right. of bad, right? There's, like, anti-black racism, which has historical connotations that are really bad, and that's bad racism. And then slightly less bad racism, but still racism, is Asian people saying that all white people should die. Like, yeah, that's yeah, still yeah, pretty yeah. bad, but it's not, like, quite on the level of, yeah. like, the KKK bad. As soon as you say that sort of stuff, people lose their minds yeah. because everything has to be equal to yeah. everything else. You know, it's interesting. I was reading a, a book uh, over the weekend about Rwanda. You know, really light reading, yeah, reading, yeah, uh, over the over the summer, uh. Uh, and about the uh, Rwandan genocide. And one of the things that that struck me is, you know, when you're talking about the Rwandan genocide, basically the government said, "Your neighbors are now your enemies. Go right. murder your yes. neighbors." And the so. the uh, and in three months, eight hundred thousand people are amazing. slaughtered. Yes, right. And and it occurs to you like the the development of the individual mind, the idea that you are an individual and not just a member of a collective body that is designed to go hit this other collective body. Yeah, that's actually relatively rare in human history, and it only exists in certain places at certain times. And it feels like we're now in reverse cultivation. Mm-hmm. Like we spent we spent literally millennia trying to get to the point where we thought of ourselves as individuals with independent thoughts and motives and who could stand up to the mob. Yeah. And when I look at the world now, I think that we have this weird idea that all bad people, that, that the Nazis were basically monsters who were not actual human beings, mm-hmm. who were just bad, who did bad yeah, things. Yeah. They, were Nazi, they, they, they weren't human beings who did monstrous things. They were monsters who weren't human in any way. Right. And so when we look at, that's a very self-flattering point of view. Like, we're all good people. Yeah, we would never do anything like that. I don't, I don't buy that at all. I think, yeah. that, I think that pretty much everybody is capable of, of doing Peter, really Peter terrible s- things. Peter says that. I mean, it's like, that. this is like, what is it that, like, and I, I, there's a dude... Do you ever read any? Is it Rene, Rene Girard? Does that ring a bell? Yeah, 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 yeah. that's his name. The, yeah. The, yeah, the whole idea of just like imitation. It's like, and I think social media. I've been reading that, and I've been thinking about the, why is it getting worse? Is because social media is enabling the repeat, repeat behavior, being able to imitate each other, and that's creating more of a mob rule. Like it, it's disseminating it, the, the, these memes and this and, the, and these feelings, so we can all just join in and swarm. You know, and that, and, and, and like, if I don't like Ben Shapiro, I can get a hundred thousand people or four thousand people yeah. who feel like a hundred thousand. I think it, I think that's why it feels like it's regressive. It's going back because I think social media is making that possible. Maybe, it, maybe it doesn't result in anything bad. Like, you don't, nobody gets killed. It's not Rwanda because right. it's a social media. But I noticed that social media does destroy careers and that's physical. Yeah, like Justin Sacco, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, she got the famous. Yeah, where she flew to South Africa before making an AIDS joke. Or while after making, while yeah, making exactly. an AIDS joke, which in which the joke was about a, like a, um, AIDS. Uh, it, it Disproportionately was about, affecting black people right, in right. Africa or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, it wasn't like a neg- it was She was making a political point right, that and, liberals would have loved. Anybody would have, you know. And she got totally, by the time she landed, she was over. Do you think there's any hope that there's going to be any cross-aisle discussion, you know, any time in the near future? Because it just looks... I mean, there's some people, but it just it yeah, feels, it feels uglier and uglier. I know. I don't. I don't know. I don't know. That, I, the the only upside I could think is that maybe we just are moving away from politics. Hopefully, like most of America is. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I, I hope so too. And I think that uh, you know, one of the things that you do that's so great is that you bring a lot of culture into into what it is that you do, and that is space where I think that. So long as the left doesn't destroy our common cultural space, too, yeah, uh, I think that, that we can actually have some space. So, wh- where do you? S- what do you want to do over the next few years? I mean, like, what's your, what's your goal? I know these are weird I like questions. Doing, but. I actually like doing what I'm doing. I enjoy I enjoy writing every day. That's the thing that I like to do, and I'll probably do uh, as long as Fox will have me. I'm, I enjoy. I mean, I I don't know many people who are doing what I do. I'm the only me at the network. I, don't, I can't think of anybody, and so I like the being unique. Not a lot of funny conservatives. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're coming. They're, there's a, there's a few though that I found on my show uh, that I'm like really like I had a few uh, last week, you know, and I would say that they're non-liberal, like Joe DeVito and Joe Mackey and Chris Freed. Or, these are all young guys that I, you know, it's funny. I don't like even labeling them because I don't want to hurt them. Right. No, so, that, that's, you know that's, that's I, mean? I don't want even. No, we get we get we get noticed. I, I know a bunch of like major Hollywood folks who listen to the show, watch yeah, this okay, kind so, of thing. Yeah, and I'll, I'll legitimately say to them, you cannot let people know that you ever watch any I'm, of this stuff. I have a buddy who is super hip in the music world, probably one of the hippest people, who is was more excited about the podcast when you did with me, and will be excited about this. But I'm not going to say his name. Yeah, I'll tell you after. But I'm not going to say his name because it would just not help him at all. I mean, they, but they, this they, guy is so hip. He's like, if people found out about it, Pitchfork 
would be, you know, Pitchfork Media would oh, freak yeah. out. Oh, yeah, no question. I mean, the, the list of people who have actually been to the offices who we will not take pictures of because we'll say to them, like, this was Duplass's mistake. He came in. I told him, dude, don't okay. let people know that you were here. Yeah. He did, and he got destroyed, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, that, yeah, that's, yeah. that's how bad it is. But, you know, I think that hopefully there will be a rational middle that, and not even in terms of political viewpoint, but just a rational middle where people can actually have these discussions yeah. again that well, will be podcast, very helpful. The, the podcast movement is... Where it's at, I really do, and I and I talk. We're going to start doing some stuff at Fox, this Fox Nation, the Fox Nation stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah. Mean, podcast I mean, on I mean, that? Yeah, I think so. Well, I mean, I haven't fun. already, right? So I'll probably do another thing. But it really, I, I think the the idea of these longer form conversations are really really helpful. I mean, between between you, obviously you and Rogan, Rogan's and great, Dave Rubin and and uh, Scott, uh, Sam Harris. I love Scott Adams' Periscopes in the morning. And I, I, I watch because he's because it's like it's, it's he's a it, wild dude. He is he's something else. <laughs> We're gonna get him on here. He's easy oh, kick. Oh, you yeah. And I'm I'm seeing him tomorrow where he's gonna be interviewing me in San Francisco. And uh, yeah, he's he's definitely his own thinker. You know, <laughs> no question. <laughs> well, it's been really a pleasure to have you on. I really appreciate it. And everybody should go out right now and buy this very book. Not this one in my hand. I already own it. This one, the Gutfeld Monologues. Go check it out. It really is fantastic. Greg, thanks so much for stopping awesome, by. Awesome, buddy. Thank you so much. The Ben Shapiro Show Sunday Special is produced by Jonathan Hay. Executive producer Jeremy Boring. Associate producers Mathis Glover and Austin Stevens. Edited by Alex Zingaro. Audio is mixed by Mike Caromina. Hair and makeup is by Jesua Alvera. And title graphics by Cynthia Angulo. The Ben Shapiro Show Sunday Special is a Daily Wire Forward Publishing production. Copyright Forward Publishing 2018.